Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Sight for White and White Sense, welcoming you to this week's Talking News on Friday the 10th of May 2024. Are we allowed to officially say that summer's here? Apparently this week is going to continue into next week and we're going to stay a little bit warmer. Let's hope this is true. A little bit of stress in our house at the moment, as I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing GCSEs this week starting and then all the way through to the 19th of June, just before the festival on the island. So far, we've experienced Spanish oral and biology, so I'm hoping that the rest of them go as well as these two appear to have gone. A big thank you to those who attended the Chillerton Coffee Morning last Saturday, where we raised over £400 in a couple of hours. A fantastic day. We've also got some other events coming up. We're at Bembridge Street Fair on the 27th of May, and we are actually at the Isle of Wight Festival in June. If you would like to volunteer for, to help with the fundraising, every single person is very, very valued, and we'd look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Lisa, CEO, Site for White. Here is this week's charity news for the 10th of May 2024. Swimming is on Monday at the Medina Leisure Centre, Newport, between 1.15 and 2.15 p.m. We have the whole pool, so whether you have whether you swim lanes or just want relaxing time in the water, please come along. The cost is £6 plus transport if provided. There is no yoga on Tuesday, but we'll resume next Tuesday, the 21st, at Millbrook House. Yoga runs from 1.45pm to 2.45pm, and the cost is £4, which includes refreshments. Our weekly coffee and chat is on Wednesday at Millbrook House, between 10am and 11.30am. The cost is £2, which includes coffee and cake. Staff are always on hand to help with any inquiries and equipment will be available to try out. Thursday is Mix and Mingle. This group meets between 10.30am and 2pm every week. Booking for this group is essential and at the moment there is a waiting list for people to join. Advance notice for all our White Sense clients next. Our next coffee meeting is on Monday the 13th at Thompson Nursery. Harriton, starting at 10.30am to 12pm. This is open to everyone. Our May Eye on Social is at the Isle of Wight College on May the 21st for a three-course meal plus tea and coffee. The cost is £11.50. This is open to everyone, members, volunteers, family and friends. If you would like to come along, please let Susan know by Monday as she needs to let the college know numbers and menu choices. People who wish to attend the new group, Walk and Talk, the next date is May the 24th. It starts at LA Bowl Ride at 10am, walking to Puckpool for coffee and cake. Transport is available from Millbrook House, but please call the office to put your name down. We held our Chillerton Village Market last Saturday and are delighted to say we raised a fantastic £420. The sun shone and people came out to support us, which is fantastic. So thank you to everyone who came along, baked cakes and helped on the day. If anyone is interested in a short break holiday in 2025 at Warner's Yarmouth, please contact Susan to put your name down of the interested parties list. This is so we can gauge interest before a block booking is made. Our monthly 100 club has spare balls available. If anyone would like to buy a ball, this is £2 per month or £24 for the full year. The more balls in draw, the higher the prize money each month. If you would like to take part in our monthly draw, please call the office. This is part of our fundraising activities. If you would like to join any activity or want more details, please call the office on 5222. Zero 05. This is Chris and Brian sitting in a memorial park in Old Amersham in Buckinghamshire, reading the talking news. Miriam Margoyles, Aggers and Tuffers and Plastic Mermaids to headline White Proms 2024. An article from Isle of Wight Radio. The White Proms Festival has been announced, it has announced its 2024 lineup. The festival celebrates comedy, opera, drag, 
country music, sport, musical theatre, dance and classical proms and takes place annually in August at Northwood House in Cowes. This year sees a new logo for the festival and a new site layout. Headliners announced include award-winning actress Miriam Margoyles, OBE, cricket legends Aggers and Tuffers, Acker Jonathan Agnew and Phil Tufnell, island favourites Plastic Mermaids, who are performing with a live orchestra, their only gig on the Isle of Wight this year. Winner of RuPaul's Drag Race UK, Danny Beard and fellow RuPaul star Scarlet Harlot, hosted by Tanya Hyde. Anthem's Ibiza Orchestra, featuring 1990s tunes from the likes of Fatboy Slim, The Chemical Brothers, Faithless, Daft Punk, Ian Van Dahl, Prodigy and many more. Family favourite Peter and the Wolf with Wind Quintet. Musical theatre legends John Owen Jones, famous for playing the roles of Phantom, the Phantom of the Opera, and Jean Valjean Les Mis in both the West End and Broadway. Jenna Lee James, who has just played the role of Elsa in Disney's Frozen on the West End. John Partridge, who has starred in many shows on the West End, including Cats, Grease, Starlight Express, Cabaret and La Cage au Folle. Soprano, Farrell Smith, who shot to fame as a 12-year-old on Britain's Got Talent in 2008, is now a graduate of the opera course at the Guildhall School in London. The White Proms Festival, sponsored by Red Funnel, was founded in 2018 by Cowes resident Mike Christie, who is also now known for being in the multi-platinum selling vocal harmony group G4, who shot to fame on The X Factor back in 2004. This year marks G4's 20th anniversary, with two island performances at the Medina Theatre in June and Newport Minster in November, amongst their mega 110 tour dates. Tickets go on sale at 10am on Friday, May the 10th, and can be purchased online. There are meet and greet tickets available to have the chance to meet some of the headliners, and when buying tickets, you can donate to the White Proms Festival's Associated Island Charity, Independent Arts, which uses the arts to improve well-being, quality of life, and to reduce social isolation on the Isle of Wight. The White Proms Festival will take place from August the 9th to the 18th of August, with further details available online. This is Brian reading an item from Isle of Wight Radio. New dementia hub to open in Cowes next week. A dedicated space for island services to work together to provide essential support to islanders living with dementia is set to open in Cowes next week. The Alzheimer Cafe Isle of Wight and their dedicated team of volunteers have worked tirelessly to carry out a program of improvement and refurbishment work at the Parkland site on Park Road. Most of this work has been made possible through an ongoing fundraising campaign and generous donations from island residents. The Alzheimer Cafe Isle of Wight has already opened a bright and vibrant community cafe at Parklands, where everyone is welcome. We are now pleased to announce the opening of the Alzheimer Cafe at Parklands on Monday the 13th of May, offering a wide range of services for people living with or caring for someone with dementia. Parklands will be a friendly space where people can get the expert advice and information they need, access training, or just enjoy a coffee and a chat. It also offers a well-being club for people living with dementia, providing a safe and supportive environment where people will have the opportunity to revisit hobbies or engage in new activities that interest them, enabling relatives and carers to have a break. 
Maggie Bennett from the Alzheimer Cafe Isle of Wight said, Alzheimer cafes on the Isle of Wight have been supporting people living with dementia, their families, friends and carers since 2009. We're very excited to be able to extend the support to so many more people through our services at Parklands. This is a place where you will be greeted by a smiling face where you can find the information you need and somewhere that everyone can feel safe and find respite for a while. It is one year since the Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet approved a 50-year lease of the Parkland site to be used as a community base offering a meeting place, activities, training, support and advice for people and families living with dementia. Councillor Debbie Andre, Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Public Health added, the Isle of Wight Dementia Strategy, published in 2022, was the culmination of what island residents told us was needed for people to live well with dementia in our communities. People told us they needed a local dementia hub where people can go for support, advice, activities, company and friendship. Parklands meets these two key objectives of the Isle of Wight Dementia Strategy and the Isle of Wight Council are proud to support this much needed initiative and look forward to watching it grow and develop in the future. The grand opening of Parklands is taking place on Monday the 13th of May between 10am and 4pm. The opening ceremony will take place at 11am. Everyone is welcome to come along and find out more about the services on offer and meet with a wide range of local services. This is Dan reading an article from the Island Echo. Sandown Carnival date confirmed and here's how you can enter. Sandown Carnival, in existence since 1889, has launched its latest carnival season with the children's and main carnival processions pencilled in for Saturday the 27th of July. Seven girls and boys have been chosen as the town's 2024 carnival royalty and up to £300 is on offer to help people put together an entry in this summer's parades. Sandown Carnival Chair Paul Kuzlant has said, We are proud to be one of the island's oldest carnivals and can't wait to get our new season underway in July. We're always keen to help anyone with a good idea for their parade entry and there's still time to apply to the fund we make available each year. Would-be entrants need to take part in two of the town's 2024 parades and must apply by 1600 hours on Friday the 27th of May. Anyone can put in an application with priority given to those in the PO36 postcode area. Application packs can be downloaded at www.sandowncarnival.com forward slash carnival hyphen participation hyphen fund or picked up from Sandown's Carnival Shop at 77A High Street, PO36 8AD. Sandown Children's Carnival and Main Carnival both take place on Saturday the 27th of July, with Sandown Illuminated Carnival on Wednesday the 28th of August. The Carnival also organises Sandown Bay Regatta over the weekend of the 10th and 11th of August. Details of all Sandown Carnival's 2024 events can be found at www.sandowncarnival.com forward slash event hyphen calendar. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Island Echo, headlined Isle of Wight Ramblers Protest English Heritage Coastal Path Refusal. Isle of Wight Ramblers protested at the gates of Osborne House in East Cowes on Monday this week against English Heritage's refusal to allow a new coastal path to run through the grounds. English Heritage, the charity in charge of the former royal residence, maintains that the proposed path constitutes a security risk to its collection of artefacts belonging to the late Queen Victoria. However, Isle of Wight Ramblers believe the failure to grant access places walkers in danger as they will be forced to use a main road, that's York Avenue. The route between East Cowes and Wooten, 
forms part of the proposals for the 2,704-mile King Charles III Coast Path. The Ramblers would like to see the route following the coast past the beach at Osborne. However, English Heritage will not allow this. Isle of Wight Ramblers have said, There are currently no public footpaths in East Cowes which lead to the countryside. A coast path at Osborne and Barton would give residents the opportunity to enjoy these amazing seascapes. It would also ensure that we have one of the finest coastal stretches in England, attracting many tourists. However, Isle of Wight Ramblers has met many organisations and politicians and have concluded that Natural England is unlikely to pursue a coastal route and must therefore follow the main A3021 road towards Whippingham. A 2,700-mile England coast path, a new national trail, is being implemented and nationally much of the trail is open for enjoyment. However, on the island, no part is yet open. The route from East Cowes to Wooten has not yet been determined. And this is one of just two locations nationwide where Natural England has not yet proposed a route. Indeed, we are the only location where there is no route proposed where there are no existing public footpaths. The Osborne Estate is a designated park and garden and is exempt from the coastal access scheme and it seems that a large diversion will be needed along the main A3021 bypassing Osborne and Barton Estates and on towards Whippingham. The Isle of Wight Ramblers feel that this is unacceptable. The National Trail was named King Charles III England Coast Path after the coronation last year. Surely a national trail following a main road with no coast views is not fit to be called a King's Coast Path. Ramblers Vice President Kate Ashbrook has said, Osborne Estate was given to the nation by Edward VII in 1902. A national trail should be allowed through a national asset. So many other large estates such as Blenheim, Stourhead, RHS Wisley, Windsor Great Park, all have public rights of way where people can enjoy our heritage. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Auction at Cowball Watermill raises vital funds for the pit wheel repair. An auction selling off pieces from the Rural Museum at Calbourne Watermill last weekend, Saturday the 4th of May, has raised vital funds that are to be spent on fixing the mill's pit wheel. It was back at the beginning of the month that the popular attraction shared a post to its Facebook page stating that it was set to permanently close its doors to the public. As previously reported by Island Echo, with items from the establishment's museum to be auctioned off. Despite the initial fears of total closure, it has now emerged that the mill would remain open, but that funds were desperately needed to repair the pit wheel. Over 300 lots went under the hammer at the event held over the bank holiday weekend. Among the lots that sold at the public event were Lot 4 A 1940 Dennis fire engine with original wooden turntable ladder, hosing, nozzles, etc. Guide price £4,000 to £6,000, sold for a whopping £6,800. Lot 82. An Elizabeth II red painted telephone box, guide price £100 to 200 pounds sold for a whopping 2,000 pounds. Lot 84, a Bailey cast iron turnstile, originally from Ride Pier and which was used at the first Isle of Wight festival. Guide price 100 to 200 pounds, sold for 700 pounds to councillor Jonathan Bacon. Lot 94. A. Tasker and Sons of Andover, early farm steam engine. Guide price £1,200 to £1,500. Sold for a whopping £13,600. Lot 95. 
a 50s Saunders Row built experimental Black Knight rocket test casting. This was part of Britain's first attempt at the space race and its engines were tested at the needles. Guide price 2000 to 3000 pounds, sold for 1500 pounds. Lot 308, a six foot high cast metal water feature in the form of a mythical dragon. Guide price 4,000 to 5,000 pounds, sold for 3,800 pounds. Lot 372, an antique cast metal cannon with GR embossed motto which is seven foot long and was situated at the entrance of the mill. Guide price, 200 to 300 pounds. Sold for 4,000 pounds. The other one that was there sold for just 1,800. It is understood that the value of the item sold before commission and fees, etc. was around 60,000 pounds. A post on the Calbourne Watermill Facebook page has thanked those who attended the event, saying, We appreciated you coming and bidding for the items. Please keep us updated on how you renovate and treasure them. We are hoping to have raised enough funds to finish the repairs to our pit wheel and be milling flour again. It will be brilliant to provide stone ground, water powered, top quality flour to islanders again. Thank you to all our wonderful island community for all your kind words and messages of understanding. We are truly blessed to live in a caring community and beautiful place. This is Brian reading an article from the Island Echo. Upgrades planned in ride thanks to long-term plan for town's program. A chair for Ride Town Board has been appointed in what is set to be an exciting period of growth and transformation for the town. The newly appointed chair, Stephen Holbrook, has hit the ground running to establish a new independent board that will oversee a £20 million levelling up funded grant from government. Ride is one of 75 towns across the UK to benefit from the government's new long-term plan for towns programme. The chair will act as a champion for Ride, ensuring the town board is community-led and effective at targeting investment, which help build a better future for local people. As the decision-making body responsible for leading the development and delivery of the Ride's long-term plan, the board will work closely with local people to identify and unlock investment priorities across the town. Establishing a board that represents the community and businesses of Ride, covering the broad themes of safety and security, high streets, heritage and regeneration, and, and transport and connectivity is a crucial part of accessing the funding. A visit to mark the appointment was made by the long-term plan for town's interim programme director, Adam Hawksby, who met with the new chair as well as local business owners to get a sense of the opportunities and challenges, challenges facing Ride. Stephen Holbrook said, I'm excited to be leading on this collaborative project that will not only really make a difference to Ride, but also the island. £20 million is, is a hugely significant amount of government money, and we will work hard to maximise its impact. We will be imaginative with a view to leveraging other funding and creating legacy projects. I'm looking forward to engaging with residents and stakeholders to make the absolute best of this exciting opportunity. This is a great moment in history for Ride Town and its residents, but it's a project that will make it a better place, not just for the residents, but also see investment that will bring islanders to ride more often, as well as improving one of our gateway destinations for off-island visitors. This is Den reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Two Isle of Wight businesses have received prestigious awards. 
Roxall's Isle of Wight Donkey Sanctuary was named Family Attraction of the Year at the Muddy Stiletto Awards for the second consecutive year, while Wooden's Bayliss and Booth won the Lifestyle Store category. A spokesperson for the Isle of Wight Donkey Sanctuary said, An enormous thank you to everyone who voted for us. We're absolutely thrilled to be regional winners in the Best Family Attraction category. Regional winners from every category now automatically go through to the national finals. The Muddy Stiletto editors then judge who is the best of the place in each category, announcing the national winners on the July 11th. So watch this space. Muddy Stilettos first tottered into the world in 2011 as a way for national lifestyle journalist Hero Brown to find out and share the fun stuff to do in the local area. Quickly, Muddy Stilettos caught on locally as a witty, useful, tastefully curated and researched insider's guide to the very best food, walks, boutiques, day trips, hotels, interiors and events for smart, fun-loving women living outside London. Bayliss and Booth revealed their joy at winning via a social media post, stating, We are thrilled to announce we have won the coveted Muddy Stilettos Award for Best Lifestyle Store in the region. We are so appreciative of all the votes and support. You can find out more about the Muddy Stilettos online. Hi, this is Steve with a story from Isle of Wight Radio with the headline, Isle of Wight Beaches Praised in Clean Water League Table. The Isle of Wight has performed well in a new league table of clean beaches, with all of its beaches rated either excellent with three stars or good two stars for water cleanliness in summer. The Isle of Wight received a mid-table finish overall, coming ninth out of 19 locations on the league table but it's one of only four counties where every monitored beach is either good or excellent for seawater cleanliness in summer. However, Dorset, Devon and Suffolk have higher percentages of beaches rated excellent for clean water, according to UK travel site Holiday Park Guru. They analysed Environment Agency summer water quality data from hundreds of beaches to name the best and worst locations. The nation's 13 dirtiest beaches are being offered brown flag awards, including Blackpool North Beach, Western Supermare Western Main Beach, and Bogner Regis at Aldwick. The winners are being offered complimentary brown flags featuring poo emojis to display for swimmers. These beaches are rated poor by the Environment Agency due to bacteria such as E. coli from sewage and other waste. None of the Isle of Wight's beaches have been awarded Brown Flag Awards for 2024. Lancashire came bottom of England's league table, with none of its 10 designated bathing spots achieving the coveted three-star excellent rating for cleanliness. Somerset, Norfolk, Yorkshire and Kent were all in the bottom half of the league table. Keen sea swimmer Robbie Lane from Holiday Park Guru said, High praise is warranted for England's 273 beaches with the top rating for their water quality, including 11 beaches on the Isle of Wight. Commiserations to our 13 winners this year. We really are top of the plops. We just hope they'll take up our offer of a free brown flag, although I'm afraid we can't quite afford to provide a flagpole as well. It's worth noting that the Environment Agency only includes water quality readings from May the 15th to September the 30th when giving ratings to bathing areas. Seawater quality tends to be worse in winter after heavy rain. Percentage of beaches rated excellent by the Environment Agency for seawater cleanliness from best to worst, and that's Dorset with 89%, Devon 86%, Suffolk, 83%, Cornwall, 81%, Tyne and Weir, 78%, Northumberland, 77 Lincolnshire also at 77 Hampshire in the New Forest at 75%, the Isle of Wight coming in at 73%, 
Merseyside, it drops down to 57%. Essex, 53%. Sussex, 52%. Cumbria, 50%. Norfolk, 50%. Kent, and now we're down to 45%. Yorkshire, 40%. County Durham, 16%. Somerset, 10%. And Lanarkshire, bottom of the table, with 0%. This is Chris reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight shoppers helping to tackle rising levels of hygiene poverty. An Isle of Wight store has teamed up with leading suppliers to tackle hygiene poverty. Tesco has again joined forces with its suppliers of well-known household brands such as Radox, Shaw, Bodyform and Aquafresh to help distribute millions of personal care items to people who are in need. For every two purchases by the Isle of Wight Tesco Superstore customers from a selection of essential hygiene products, its suppliers will donate a third hygiene item directly to the charity in kind direct. Participating in the campaign are Unilever, Essity, Halion and Kimberly Clark, and they are joined by a new partner, Edgewell. These products will be distributed by In Kind Direct, which works with charities, community groups, food banks and schools to get much needed hygiene products into the hands of people who need them. Recent research commissioned by Essity in partnership with Tesco and in Kind Direct has illustrated how Isle of Wight people are currently experiencing hygiene poverty. Families are often impacted and this survey revealed that 13% of households with dependents in the region have gone without hygiene products such as shampoo or deodorant. The survey also found that those people across the region who have struggled to buy hygiene products during the last year have had to borrow from friends or family 27% or used free products in public areas 27%. Roseanne Gray, CEO at In Kind Direct, said, Many people experiencing hygiene poverty face the impossible decision to heat, eat or keep clean on a daily basis. And unfortunately, more and more people are being pushed into this position. We know hygiene poverty disproportionately affects those already struggling, but the research shows that financial difficulties are now impacting everyone. The ripple effect impacts mental health, workplace productivity and school attendance. It's something that requires collective action, which is why we formed this partnership with Tesco and some of our committed corporate partners to help reduce hygiene poverty. Thomas Mayer, category buying manager for beauty and personal care at Tesco added, This new research highlights how the number of families being impacted by hygiene poverty has grown in recent years. That is why the work done by In Kind Direct to help people is so important and we are really pleased to be working again with our suppliers to provide hygiene products where they are needed most. The campaign is running in the Tesco Isle of Wight Superstore until the 11th of June. This is Brian reading an article from the Island Echo. New team rector appointed by Bishop of Portsmouth to take over key island role. The Bishop of Portsmouth has appointed the Reverend Chris Bradish as the new team rector to lead Church of England churches in Newport, Carisbrook and Gatcombe. Chris is currently rector of Andover Parish, which includes four churches in North Hampshire, but will head to the Isle of Wight with his wife, Naomi, and three children this summer, and is likely to be licensed on September the 15th. He will lead the staff team that includes the current team vicars, the Reverends Emma Cooksey and Steve Sutcliffe, following in the footsteps 
of interim team rector Canon Sarah Chapman, who stepped down earlier this year. Chris trained for ordination at Ripon College, Cuddesdon, served for a year on the staff at Holy Trinity Brompton, and has since been involved in helping the church in Andover grow in discipleship, faith, and mission across a range of worshipping styles and traditions. Upon, upon being appointed in the role, Chris has said, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to serve Newport, Carisbrook and Gatcombe as team rector and to join the team and others in progressing the church's mission to the Isle of Wight. The churches at the heart of the island are poised for something new. You can feel it. As a family, we're looking forward to making new friends, learning new things and being part of this new chapter in the church's life. We'll be sad to leave Andover, where, where, where we've made so many friends, but it's a huge privilege to be called to the island. I'm looking forward to building on the prayers, hard work and service of so many parishioners, staff, volunteers and donors who've transformed Newport Minster into a wonderful, bright space for worship of the living God. It's equally clear that all the churches have inspiring testimonies of God's love at work through their long and rich histories. I'm looking forward to learning these stories as we look to the future in St. John's, Carisbrook and Gatcombe. Chris was working as a solicitor in London when he felt called to ordained ministry. He trained in Oxford and was ordained as a deacon and then as a priest at Winchester Cathedral. He served his curacy in Alton and then spent a year on staff at Holy Trinity Brompton before moving to Andover. During Chris's time in Andover, his work has included a major reordering of St. Mary's and a town-wide pastoral reorganization. His wife, Naomi, is a social worker and currently works for the NHS, leading a mental health team, and be looking for a similar role on the island their three children, Peter, aged 11, Juliet, 8, and Lydia, 6, will transfer to Ireland schools. St Mary's is a big civic church where we have seen the Lord renew faith and transform lives in some extraordinary ways. The, the church has grown as a gathered community, but it's deeply committed to its sense of place alongside that. Thinking at a town-wide level, this has opened up some wonderful opportunities for the gospel. Andover doesn't have some of the institutions that Newport has, certainly not a castle, but I hope my experiences will be relevant. A thriving ministry in the centre creates space to forge new links between churches and communities across the island, where the prospect of mutual belonging and sharing and sharing gifts speaks to a generous God who is on the move. The long hoped for reordering of Newport Minister, Minster is a joyful story in itself and provides a fantastic platform for growth with hospitality and prayer at its heart. We're looking forward to discovering what a great place the island is for family life. The Bishop, the Right Reverend Jonathan Frost, is expected to license Chris to his role at four o'clock on 15th of September in Newport Minster. This is Dan reading an article from the Island Echo. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, visits the Royal Yacht Squadron Isle of Wight Foundation. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, visited the Royal Yacht Squadron Isle of Wight Foundation at the RYS Castle, Cowes, on the 1st of May. The foundation was established in 2015 to mark the bicentenary of the Royal Yacht Squadron. During his visit, His Royal Highness had a short working lunch with key volunteers and the Commodore of the Royal Yacht Squadron. His Royal Highness then met trustees and volunteers, training providers from schools and colleges, local employers and some of the young people who have been helped. He then travelled by launch to, care, to Clare Lallow Boatyard, where he met three RYS Foundation-sponsored apprentices and their supervisors in their workplace. Christy Lee Taylor, Deputy Clerk to HM Lord Lieutenant Isle of Wight, has said, If you know of any young person from the Isle of Wight, 
who may be facing a financial barrier to finding employment in the maritime sector, please get in touch. The RYS Foundation may be able to help with course fees, IT support, toolkits, transport costs, or simply a bit of inf informal advice and maybe a useful connection. Hello everyone, this is Steve reading a story from Isle of Wight Radio, headlined Isle of Wight Council to Move to Committee System in 2025. The Isle of Wight Council has decided to change the way it makes decisions by moving to a committee system of governance. At an extraordinary meeting of the full council, it was agreed the council's current leader and cabinet-led structure, where most decisions are taken by an appointed councillor, will be replaced with a committee system, which will come into effect at the annual council meeting in May 2025. The council will use the coming year to fully prepare for the changes. By law, the changes can only be fully adopted at an annual council meeting. And now that councillors have passed a formal resolution opting for a new governance system, the decision cannot be revisited for five years. A committee system is where the council is divided into several committees that make the decisions on different parts of the council's business. Each of these committees is normally made up of a proportionately balanced number of councillors from each of the political groups and those not aligned to any of those groups. Some decisions can only be taken by all councillors at a full council meeting, such as setting the budget and council tax and other committees that deal with any regulatory matters, such as planning and licensing. The committee system will include a policy, finance and resources committee and four services committees covering children's services, education and skills, adult social care, public health and housing, economy, regeneration, transport and infrastructure, and environment and community protection. This means that more councillors are actively involved in decision making and is seen to be more inclusive. Decisions are made collectively by committee members with a shared accountability for the decisions made. Legal scrutiny functions will be taken on by the relevant committees and others that currently operate, such as planning and licensing, remain unchanged. The Council will keep to the current leader and cabinet-led structure until the official implementation of the committee system in May 2025, following the Isle of Wight Council elections. This is the second part of the Talking News, read by Sam and Kate. We begin with more news items taken from the County Press and the Observer, starting with barriers moved on Landslide Road. Changes have been made to the hard closure of Leeson Road following December's major landslide. The Isle of Wight Council has moved the barriers on the Shanklin side to allow access to the Downs via Nansen Hill and the Bond Church Landslip car park from Shanklin. The barriers are now in place from the Ventnor side of the entrance to Bond Church Landslip, Landslip car park. While the hard closure is still in place for pedestrians and vehicles, it does mean walkers can now access the downs from both ends, in theory meaning there is now a walking route between Ventnor and Shanklin, albeit with a significant off-road diversion. It means pedestrians can walk up Leeson Road and past the landslip, but they can't walk through to Shanklin on the pavement because the hard closure remains in place further up the road. A council spokesperson explained the changes. The car park at the far end of Smugglers Haven has been opened and the barriers moved to allow walkers access to Nansen Hill and the Downs. This allows the coastal path diversion to come into effect. The car park is not included within the area identified via the, via the independent experts employed by Island Roads as requiring monitoring prior to being reopened. The barriers remain on, on the road as a hard closure to all access until monitor, monitoring equipment evidence confirms that it is safe for Island Roads to open the road. The road closure is in effect from the signs lower down Leeson Road at the junction with Bonchurch Chute. Access is provided for residents, utilities 
and services such as refuse, vehicles, post office and deliveries. The council would like to remind people to be aware of their surroundings and not put themselves or others at risk while they explore areas around the island. Isle of Wight Ramblers posted a graphic showing the routes in the area. Meanwhile, another meeting is to be held in Ventnor to update residents on the latest news on the landslide and road closures. It will be on Tuesday, May the 14th, and is a ticketed event via the Isle of Wight Council. This is the second part of the Talking News, read by Sam and Kate. We begin with more news items taken from the County Press and the Observer, starting with barriers moved on Landslide Road. Changes have been made to the hard closure of Leeson Road following December's major landslide. The Isle of Wight Council has moved the barriers on the Shanklin side to allow access to the Downs via Nansen Hill and the Bond Church Landslip car park from Shanklin. The barriers are now in place from the Ventnor side of the entrance to Bond Church Landslip, Landslip car park. While the hard closure is still in place for pedestrians and vehicles, it does mean walkers can now access the Downs from both ends in theory meaning there is now a walking route between Ventnor and Shanklin, albeit with a significant off-road diversion. It means pedestrians can walk up Leeson Road and past the landslip, but they can't walk through to Shanklin on the pavement because the hard closure remains in place further up the road. A council spokesperson explained the changes. The car park at the far end of Smugglers Haven has been opened and the barriers moved to allow walkers access to Nansen Hill and the Downs. This allows the coastal path diversion to come into effect. The car park is not included within the area identified via the, high, via the independent experts employed by Island Roads as requiring monitoring prior to being reopened. The barriers remain on, on the road as a hard closure to all access until monitor, monitoring equipment evidence confirms that it is safe for island roads to open the road. The road closure is in effect from the signs lower down Leeson Road at the junction with Bonchurch Chute. Access is provided for residents, utilities and services such as refuse, vehicles, post office and deliveries. The council would like to remind people to be aware of their surroundings and not put themselves or others at risk while they explore areas around the island. Isle of Wight Ramblers posted a graphic showing the routes in the area. Meanwhile, another meeting is to be held in Ventnor to update residents on the latest news on the landslide and road closures. It will be on Tuesday, May the 14th, and is a ticketed event via the Isle of Wight Council. Shock as the fire station closure forces the crew out. Firefighters in East Cowes have been forced to leave their station building and move to another town after significant structural issues were found at the site. East Cowes Fire Station is being closed over health and safety fears caused by subsidence. A search for a temporary site has been underway but, to date, no suitable location has been found, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service said. It means the station's crews and fire engine will be moving to Newport Fire Station. The East Cowes crews will carry out their drill nights and train there. Glenn Bowyer, the Director of Operations for the Hampton Isle of Wight Service said. We're also working with crews at East Cowes to enable them to mobilise from Newport when there is an incident. Glenn Bowyer said the station in East Cowes has suffered with subsidence and although underpinning has resolved the movement, the residual damage has left the building in an unmaintainable state. He added, most recent assessments of the building have led us to make the decision that our crews cannot continue to operate from the station due to health and safety concerns. At this stage, our focus is on implementing an immediate temporary solution. No long-term decisions have been made. As we go through this process, we will keep our crews and communities, who will continue to be protected by Newport and neighbouring stations, kept informed of any updates. 
Councillor Karen Lucioni, who sits on the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Authority, said the community of East Cows will continue to be well protected by Newport and the neighbouring stations. The actions being taken are based on immediate building safety concerns and no long-term decisions about the station are being considered at this stage. On Wednesday, Councillor Carl Love said crews were given just a few hours notice of the plan. He said the fire service will of course tell you that they can operate safely from Newport and Ride, but if our main road is closed or congested, every minute will count, especially if we have a major incident. Councillor Lucioni said you will be seeking assurances over a new building for the town. Sad death after fire. Firefighters worked through the night on Tuesday to tackle the fire in Gaggle Hill Lane, Brystone. The fire service was alerted at 2am with crews from Newport, Freshwater, Yarmouth, Cowes and Shanklin on the scene, along with specialist vehicles and an aerial ladder platform. Firefighters wearing breathing apparatus used main jets to tackle the blaze. Efforts were also made to prevent damage to neighbouring properties and residents were evacuated as a precaution. Nearby residents were evacuated as a precaution and other local residents were advised to keep windows and doors closed due to smoke in the area. By 8am the incident had been scaled back with two fire engines and one aerial ladder platform damping down hot spots to prevent further spread of the fire. Yesterday, Thursday, it was confirmed by police that an unnamed man in his 40s sadly perished in the fire. His next of kin had been informed. It is believed his three dogs died alongside him. There was an ongoing investigation. There was also a panned fire in the kitchen of a flat in Milligan House in West Street in Ryde on Tuesday afternoon. Meanwhile, there was a fire at an agricultural building at East Ashy Manor Farm around 12.45am on Monday. At its height, the large blaze measured 15 metres by 25 metres and prompted a large response with crews from Sandown, Ride, Newport and Shanklin attending. Two officers and a water carrier also attended and hydrants, jets and hose reels were used to douse the flames. A roof on the barn building, which was close to the owner's fam family home, has been destroyed. There will be no investigation. Veteran ferry vessel sold off. Isle of Wight ferry firm Red Funnel has sold the Red Jet 4, one of its catamaran vessels, to a company in South Korea. After more than two decades ferrying foot passengers to and from the island, the boat will set sail for pastures new, having been purchased by Nam Hay Express Company. It was in March that the county press exclusively revealed the vessel was being sold. Red Funnel has said it is part of a strategic decision to focus on the upkeep and reliability of Red Jets 6 and 7. CEO Fran Collins said, we're very proud of Red Jets 4's two decades of service across the Solent. She's been a much loved member of our fleet and we are delighted that Nam Hay Express Company is adding her to its roots. However, with Red Jet 4 now over 21 years old, the time is right to shift our priorities towards the future. This aligns with the current demand for service on our Southampton to West Cows route and positions us to make the best possible decisions to chart our course from here. We wish Nam Hay Express all the very best in giving Red Jet 4 a new home and a new purpose and send our wishes for fair winds and safe travels to our passengers and crew. Later this month, the vessel will be lifted out of the water in Southampton and hoisted onto a marine freight forwarder before being transported to South Korea. Nam Hay Express Company currently operates four car ferries and six high-speed catamarans, serving popular tourist destinations including Mokpo and Jeju Island. Red Jet 4 was built by the North West Bay ships in Tasmania in 2003 
and accommodates 271 seated passengers and four crew. It is powered by two MTU diesel engines, giving a service speed of 35 knots. Red Funnel's Redjet service has been blighted with ongoing disruption in recent months. And in March, passengers were left stranded after problems with the red jet coincided with vehicle sailings also being cancelled. Ireland had lowest police election turnout. The turnout for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Police and Crime Commissioner election on the island was the lowest in the region. For an eligible electorate of 110,789, there were 9,487 postal votes and 8,692 polling station votes for a total of 18,179. That works out as a turnout of just 16.41%. The role of the Police and Crime Commissioner, PCC, was created to be the voice of the people and to hold the police to account. They are responsible for allocating funding and overseeing priorities, with an aim to cut crime and deliver an effective and efficient police service according to the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. The Isle of Wight population showed the least interest in going to the polls. The turnout figures from across the region were Haven't 29.1%, Isle of Wight 16.41%, New Forest 19.09%, Portsmouth 27.9%, Rushmore 33.6%, Southampton 29.5%, Test Valley 21.58% and Winchester 40.3%. Donna Jones, Conservative, retained her post after being re-elected with 175,000 953 votes. She beat the Labour Party's Becky Williams, 106,141, Liberal Democrats Proud Baines, 92,843, and Don Gerrard, 40,691, for the Justice and Anti-Corruption Party. The re-elected commissioner pledges more bobbies. Getting more police on the streets and more knives off them are among the priorities promised by Donna Jones, the re-elected police and crime commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. The Conservative who was first elected to the role in 2021 won with a huge 175,953 votes last Friday following the PCC elections and her nearest challenger was the Labour Party's Becky Williams, with 106,141 votes. During her first tenure as Commissioner, Donna delivered on a range of policing priorities, which included the launch of the local Bobbies scheme, with named and contactable police officers for every community across the two counties. Other accomplishments included recruitment of 650 more police officers, funding to reopen 10 more police stations, including cows, and front counters, bringing the 101 call service waiting times to under four minutes. She also introduced a new victims hub, commissioning more than £11 million of victim and perpetrator support programmes. She is one of the four national police leaders working directly with the Home Office following her appointment last year as chair of the National Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. Donna also sits on the National Policing Board, chaired by the Home Secretary James Cleverly, co-chairs the National Strategic Policing Partnership Board and works with the Probation Service, Prisons and the CPS. Speaking after the election announcement, Donna said, I'm extremely honoured to be re-elected and the hard work continues. I am determined to recruit more police officers to make sure everyone who reports a crime gets feedback and that there is a comprehensive crackdown on shoplifting. 
I will carry on making sure communities across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight are safer by making increased police visibility a priority, by taking more knives off the streets and providing focused support for victims. These are huge responsibilities and I'm looking forward to getting back to delivering for the people. Donna's pledges for her second term include the recruitment of 75 more police officers over the next 12 months, opening more police stations and front counters, cracking down on shoplifting and retail crime, delivering a rural crime task force, investing in making roads safer, reducing serious violence and ensuring people reporting a crime get feedback. Late night farm blaze, scary experience. The owners of a farm in Ashy have praised hero firefighters who did an excellent job in preventing the spread of a large blaze overnight. No one was hurt, but nonetheless, it was still a scary experience for the owners of East Ashy Manor Farm in Ashy. Flames ripped through, the through an agricultural building in the early hours of Bank Holiday Monday. At its height, the fire measured 15 metres by 25 metres and prompted a large response from Hampshire and Isle of Wight fire and rescue crews. It understood the roof to the barn building, which was close to the owner's family home, has been destroyed. Four engines from Sandown, Ride, Newport and Shanklin were alerted at 12.46 a.m. Two officers and a water carrier also attended and hydrants, jets and hose reels were used to douse the flames. A single appliance remained on scene this morning. The owners of the farm told the county press the fire service did an excellent job containing the fire so it did not spread to any other buildings and we are very grateful. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary has confirmed it is not investigating the fire and officers have not been required to attend. Polish defence of the island towns is commemorated. The 82nd anniversary of the defence of cows and East Cows by the Polish destroyer ORP Bliskawika was commemorated at the weekend. There were several events to mark the occasion with a wreath laying, a series of medal presentations by a defence attaché of the London Embassy of the Republic of Poland, General Brig Michal Sprengel, and the Friends of the ORP Bliskowika Society annual dinner at the Royal London Yacht Club. Among those presented with Silver Polish Army medals were Kay Banks, Peter Lloyd, Margaret Pryor, Robert Milner and Darren Sinix the son of the late Kenneth, who was co-founder of the Society. It was awarded to him for many years of his hard work and support for maintaining the memory of ORP Bliskowika and promoting good Anglo-Polish relations. The ORP Bliskowika has a special place in the history of cows and East cows. On the night of May the 4th, 1942, German bombers targeted the two towns, killing 70 people. The ORP Bliskowika and her sister ship, ORP Grom, were built at the local shipyard JS White & Co. The ORP Bliskowika, which was undergoing work on the River Medina at the time of the attack, turned her guns on the bombers, saving lives and property. She is currently on display in Poland and strong ties exist between the two communities. The ORP Grom was lost in Rombarken Fjord in Norway on May the 4th, 1940, and was also remembered. In English, Bliskawika means lightning and Grom means thunderbolt. Island on TV travel show. The Isle of Wight is set to feature on the new series of a travel programme on Channel 5. The second season of the Big Steam Adventure hit screens earlier this month and viewers will be able to see the beautiful island countryside during tonight's show, Friday, May the 10th. The series features journalist and presenter John Sargent, actor Peter Davidson and steam aficionado Paul Piglet Middleton as they explore Britain's countryside by steam. In this episode, John Peter and Piglet will board the Waverley, the last passenger steamship 
and navigate the Solent. They will also take a century-old Sentinel steam lorry to Carisbrook Castle via the scenic military road. Exploring the castle's history leads to a, to a ball game with John treating Piglet and Peter at the crab shed at Steephall Cove in Ventnor. The next day, they ride the Isle of Wight steam railway, with Peter trying carriage restoration before boarding the 135-year-old steam engine, Calborn. Towards Bembridge, John and Peter hitch a ride on Dragonfly, a converted steam roller termed Showman's Wagon. The episode will air at 8pm on Channel 5. Royal recognition for exceptional devotion to duty. A member of the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service has been awarded with the prestigious King's Ambulance Medal, a KAM, at a recent ceremony in London. Louise Walker, Head of Education and Community Response for the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service, is one of a small select group of people in the country to be recognised in this way. Louise was announced in the King's New Year's Honours List and has been recognised for her exceptional devotion to duty, outstanding ability, merit and conduct in her role. Receiving her medal from Anne, the Princess Royal, at a recent ceremony held at Windsor Castle, Louise said it was an absolute pleasure. I felt very proud to be wearing the ambulance uniform and to be there representing the Isle of Wight NHS Trust and all the things we believe in and work hard to achieve. When receiving that medal, quite honestly, I was just thinking about the teams and people around me because they were the reason why I was there receiving it. It was wonderful to be able to share that moment with my family too. Louise has been instrumental in expanding the availability of public access defibrillators across the island and is known to many of the island's schools and businesses through the training she and her team deliver. Victoria White, the Isle of Wight's Ambulance Service Director said, We are incredibly proud of Louise and all she has achieved alongside her colleagues and our amazing volunteers, who together have saved many lives and continue to provide an incredible service for our island community. It is wonderful for Louise and the service to be recognised in this way. Receiving the King's Ambulance Medal is very special and Louise and the service as a whole should take a moment to enjoy this recognition. Work to improve beach access gathers pace. A popular beach is to become more accessible and the move has had widespread support. Ride Beach Accessibility Partnership held an event to promote its accessible beach project which saw businesses convene at Hover Travel's Ride Terminal. Attendees received project updates and learnt about the, board, the boardwalk construction. Funding efforts saw Hover Travel contribute a £5,000 private hovercraft charter auction. The total fundraising target stands at £25,000. Go to crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash P forward slash ride hyphen beach hyphen accessibility to donate. Ride Town Council Projects Officer Annette Johansson Steed explained We have already tested the first section of the planned board boardwalk successfully, and we wanted to share and show our partners how this first milestone has exceeded expectations. A heartfelt thank you goes out to all the who contributed, from the skilled construction crew at Nash's to the incredible support of our community members who have been with us every step of the journey. Neil Chapman, Hover Travels MD, added, We know access to the beach and the seaside is something many of us take for granted, but the reality is that many of our beaches are difficult or impossible for some people to reach, and our belief is that the seaside should be for everyone. The island is the sunniest spot in the UK. When a great authority on travel, the highly respected journalist Simon Calder, says the Isle of Wight is head and shoulders the sunniest place in the UK, you sit up, take notice and slap on the factor 30. Simon has trawled through 30 years of Met Office data 
to reveal the Isle of Wight averages more than five hours of sunshine per day, more than any other place in the United Kingdom. The island resort of Shanklin is the brightest location of all, he adds. The island averages five hours, eight minutes per day, according to Simon, in an article he wrote for the independent newspaper. Only Kent comes close on the mainland, an average of 19 minutes per day less. South Glamorgan is the sunniest place in Wales, but when it comes to Scotland and Northern Ireland, Simon joked, leave those sunglasses at home. Adam grabs his chance in debut England showing. A squash player is celebrating helping his country earn silver at the, tw- the Masters Home Internationals 2024 event in Dublin. Adam's, Adam Dim- Dominey's first match was against Wales. He started well, winning the first game 11-2. In the second game, Adam kept his opponent at bay, winning 11-8. The third was a tough battle, but Adam came out on top, winning 11-9. His England teammates were also victorious, winning the tie 20-0. A televised match against the home team piled on the pressure for the following day. A gutsy performance against the experienced John Hurley saw Adam win the first game 11-9. In the second, the left-handed Islander lost 11-7, but soon fought back to take the third 11-6. In their fourth game, showing signs of tiredness, Adam started to force shots and made errors, eventually losing 11-6. Despite an early lead in the crucial in their, despite an early lead in their fifth game, Adam lost crucial points and Hurley prevailed, 11-8, taking an overall 3-2 victory. England lost 2015 against their hosts. Against Scotland, the match went England's way, and overall it meant they earned silver. Adam said, "To represent your country is the pinnacle of sport." I've coached players who have reached this level, so it's nice that I've finally got my chance. There are plans to swap old for new. Plans have been lodged with the Isle of Wight Council to demolish buildings on Embankment Road in Bembridge and replace them with dwellings, workshops and storage. An objection has already been lodged by Bembridge Parish Council, which says it believes the development is disproportionate in size and scale compared to the surrounding area. And another person comments they're calling for more pedestrian access if the plans are given the go-ahead. Meanwhile in Newport, there are re-advertised plans to knock down a house on Worsley Road and to replace it with four homes and car parking. Full details of any of these plans can be found on the council website. There are fears about traffic and impact on wildlife, uh, which have been raised as objections. The Isle of Wight College in Newport is applying to demolish a building and replace it with a new two-storey education block and landscaping. This is proposed for the site on Dodna Lane in Newport. There are even more planning applications, but that's all the paper reports. A busy schedule for the Princess Royal. The red carpet will be rolled out for royalty visiting the island next week. Princess Anne is scheduled to make visits to two important and historic institutions on the island next Thursday, May the 16th. As Royal Patron of the National Coast Watch Institution, the Princess Royal will visit Bembridge RNLI Lifeboat Station. Then, as President of the Royal Yachting Association, Princess Anne will officially open Seaview Yacht Club's new training centre in Dover Road, Seaview. A Year 5 class of 31 pupils from St Mary's Catholic Primary School Ride has been invited to attend the opening and to chat to her. Children from the school do attend training sessions at the Yacht Club. Princess Anne will be accompanied by Susie Sheldon, the island's Lord Lieutenant. Princess Anne was last on the island during Cow's Week last year. And now on to white memories and nostalgia. The county press has been bringing Islanders the news since 1884. We've delved into our archives 124 years ago in May 1900. 
Ireland MP Richard E. Webster wrote to the county press to confirm that he would be quitting after being elevated Master of the Rolls at the request of Queen Victoria. He told Islanders, I will always look back with pride upon the honour that, that you conferred on me by selecting me as your representative and shall ever retain a keen interest in everything which conduces to the welfare and prosperity of the island. Well-known hunt, island hunter stud, Blue Blood, winner of ten first place first prizes in the show ring, was put up for servicing mares at the, at the Yafford Stud Farm at the cost of three pounds. In his show ring days, Blue Blood beat two of Queen Victoria's premium winners, Shibaya Boss and Oatlands. 74 years ago, in May 1950, the construction of Sandown Secondary Modern School was given the go-ahead by County Hall's Education Committee. The site was adjacent to the former Sandown Secondary Grammar School. A blaze at Morgan's Furniture and Baby Carriage Shop, Shooters Hill, Cows, caused chaos to neighbouring shopkeepers who fought the flames to rescue their wares. Goods were removed from Wyatt's Butchers, Richard's Radio Shop, and the offices of Mr. A. S. Cripps, architect and surveyors. A Knighton couple won £10 to spend on their home after winning a national competition which asked for the six golden rules of married bliss. Mr. and Mrs. Selincourt beat off competition from 9,000 other entrants. 49 years ago, in May 1975, there was an outcry regarding a staff shortage at St Mary's Hospital. A meeting of the Isle of Wight Rehabilitation Society discussed the concern regarding the shortage of staff in professions such as occupational therapy and physiotherapy. A report from the Island Coast Guards showed that the casualty list for the 1974-75 winter was higher than ever and the main cause, that the main cause was bad weather. 34 years ago, in May 1990, uh, Southern Vectis workers overwhelmingly backed their union's call for 24-hour strikes in support of their annual pay claim. Some 260 wo workers voted. New Church Primary School was looking forward to a visit from Princess Margaret. The Princess came to the school to formally open the new school buildings and the community centre. A 42-year-old St Helens woman won the island heat of the Women's Institute Driver of the Year competition. Noreen Finlay beat 29 other competitors in answering motoring questions and completing an, e an economy driving test in a new Vauxhall Nova. Police were urging islanders not to hang their washing out overnight. A spate of thefts from washing lines saw garments ranging from underpants to jumpers being stolen. A look back in time. The Isle of Wight Observer of the 11th of May 1912 carried an interesting report about the island's oldest inhabitant. Mr Charles Pratt, the island's oldest inhabitant, will on Sunday be the recipient of innumerable messages of congratulations, for on that day he will have reached the 103rd anniversary of his birth. To be one of the oldest living persons in the British Isles is a matter of for felicitation. But to live to such an age without losing those faculties which enable one to continue to enjoy life is to achieve a distinction denied to all but a very few indeed. No one would suppose Mr Pratt to be much, if anything, over 80 years of age. And indeed his bodily and mental activity is beyond that of very many men a score of years his junior. Except that he is deaf, he bears little trace of the passing of over a century. Today he lives the life of a normal person, he sleeps fairly well, his appetite and digestion are but little impaired, and in fine weather he enjoys his daily walk. He has lost some of his vigour since a severe illness which attacked him in the winter, but at the age of 103 he is still a handsome and pleasant old gentleman. Mr Pratt who lives at Hillsborough Well Street Ride, was born at Hambledon on May the 12th, 1809. 
If there were anything in the old superstition, he would indeed be a remarkable man, for he was a seventh son of a seventh son, and our ancestors gave such persons credit for second sight and powers of magic. Mr Pratt has never discovered any supernatural gifts in itself, so it must be supposed that the virtuous died out before he came upon the scene. Old Ride Memories Asked whether Ride was very different when he first came, Mr Pratt said, No, Union Street, High Street and Cross Street were very much about the same. Of course, very many of the old houses have been pulled down and replaced by new. The greatest alteration is, of course, on the front, where the esplanade is now. When I first came to ride, the sea came nearly up to the houses, and I have seen a boat in George Street. Most of the old people who were here then are gone. I remember a Mr E. Hartsnall as well as any. It was his suggestion that a canal should be built to keep houses from being flooded on the Strand, and it, and it succeeded for there has never been the same amount of flooding down there since. When I lived at Crescent House on the Strand, I got out of bed one morning to find myself standing in water. And now on to my view, uh, starting with an opinion piece by Matthew Chatfield, headlined, We need to start a rake up June. We're in the middle of no May, no mo May. How are you doing? Moan anything this month? Probably not. If you're among, amongst the growing number of people who are adopting the on-trend idea from UK charity Plant Life, which encourages people to let grass and wildflowers grow for a month. It's a great campaign, backed by sound science. Leaving lawns to grow can be beneficial for wildlife. This year, as well as domestic gardeners, 40 local councils have signed up to the programme, including our own here on the Isle of Wight. Selected verges, parks and green spaces will be left to grow for a month. This is not a new idea. When I worked for the council, this suggestion was a regular one, and I'm glad it's now been adopted. The reason it wasn't back then, oddly enough, was cost. You'd think just, just not mowing would be cheaper, wouldn't you? Well, obviously it is, but there's more to it than that. The issue is that cutting a month's worth of grass can be a bigger job than doing a couple of regular cuts. Longer grass hides litter, which needs to be picked out before mowing. And then there's a huge issue with no mow may that applies to everyone, not just councils. The problem is this. If you leave a lot of cut grass to lie on your lawn, verge or park, you risk doing more harm to wildlife than good. Most domestic lawnmowers that do not collect grass have the option to mulch up and blow the cuttings down into the lawn. This works fine when the grass is short, but anyone who's tried to mow an overlong lawn with a fly mow or similar small, mow, small mower knows that there are limits. Commercial grass cutting equipment is sturdier stuff, but few, if any, councils pay for cuttings to be taken away during regular amnesty mowing because that's expensive and usually unnecessary. When you cut a long lawn and do not collect the clippings, there is a build-up of clumps, as the cut grass simply lies on top of the live grass and dries, or dries out or rots. This is bad for the lawn, keeping light and moisture from the plants, but also it's bad for wildlife. Wildflowers will not be able to seed, and excess nutrients on the lawn might prevent a more natural sward from developing. Plant life themselves actually advise to leave grass uncut right until the end of July, by which time the lawn would be a very tall one, especially in the damp, mild weather we are currently enjoying. They specifically recommend us to cut and collect mowings once most of the plants have been seeded. Collecting the cut grass is the key element here and is often omitted, especially by councils struggling to save a few pounds. So, if you're joining in No Mow May, however long you leave your, law your lawn, when you finally do mow, please don't forget to rake up June. Effect is few. Reflections on island life. This week written by the parent of a child bullied at school. 
Being the mother of a bullied child is an experience that carves into your heart a unique form of helplessness, one that is difficult to describe and just as hard to ignore. It's like watching a storm break from afar, knowing you want to run from the wind and the rain, but finding your feet cased in concrete, leaving you unable to move. My daughter, like so many children who endure bullying, carries a burden far heavier than her books every day to school. The emotional toll it takes on us both is immeasurable. Watching her struggle, seeing the light dim in her eyes when she recounts her experiences, or the way her shoulders slump a little more with each passing day is almost unbearable. Watching the vibrant spirit of my only child being quashed by the casual cruelty of others breaks my heart. Her daily routine becomes a cycle of dread and recovery. Each morning is a battle, convincing her to face another day, reassuring her that it will be okay, even when we both know that it may not. My afternoons anticipate her return, fearing yet longing to know if she has suffered any new wounds, whether they be words that cut deep or the cold shoulder of exclusion. One of the most excruciating aspects is when she pleads with me not to involve the school, fearing retaliation or worse, that the situation could be dismissed, making her even more vulnerable. It's a delicate balance, respecting her wishes and trying to protect her while feeling utterly helpless. Convincing her that seeking help is not a sign of weakness, but of strength is an uphill struggle. I have spoken to her head teacher privately, but asked for no active intervention, only that a watching eye is kept because of my daughter's fears. Heartbreakingly, I was told this is a common request. The feelings of helplessness are compounded by isolation, not just for her, but for us, her parents as well. Parenting should be a shared joy among those who have faced its highs and lows, yet this aspect of parenting, dealing with bullying, can feel incredibly isolating. There's an underlying current of guilt. Questions to myself on what more we could have done. Why couldn't we protect her from this? Why didn't we see the signs earlier? I cannot even imagine having to face this without a supportive husband. We try to empower our daughter and encourage her self-worth. We have conversations that feel beyond her years. Discussions about empathy, the nature of cruelty and the strength it takes not to pass on the unkindness she has faced. Amid these trials, there are moments of hope and heartening resilience. Observing her stand up for a friend or choose kindness in a world that shows her such cruelty brings a mix of pride and sorrow. Pride for the incredible person she is becoming in spite of her struggles and sorrow that she has to endure this at all. The challenge of supporting a bullied child is a difficult one. Every conversation, each tearful night, and those small victories against what she is suffering encourage me anew to be her advocate, her confidant, and her most ardent defender, her mother. And now on to public information, starting with police plan in place to tackle summer crime by Superintendent Rob Mitchell, from Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary. As the summer fast approaches, I, alongside our senior leadership team, have drawn up plans to respond to the anticipated upturn in calls for assistance from the public. With increased visitor numbers, lighter and warmer evenings, we could expect more crime and antisocial behaviour, ASB. When balancing resources with demand, we have to set priorities. These priorities can be force-led, such as burglary, vehicle crime, robbery, serious violence and better victim care. Some of our local priorities are ASB, drug-related harm, domestic abuse, road safety and shoplifting. We know these local, pro local priorities are important as they consistently come back to us when our local police teams engage and ask through surveys. Last year, reported ASB levels fell and we have some really great partnership initiatives running in places like the Bay Area. But we know it's still an issue, 
so I would encourage those affected to continue to report. If the local team doesn't know about it, they can't act. Shoplifting is a problem nationally, and particularly when committed by aggressive and violent offenders. It's not fair on businesses, shop staff, or the honest shoppers who have to witness it. We have made really strong inroads during the past 12 months, with detections increasing to over 70% by the end of March 2024. However, reported shoplifting is up year on year by over 50%. Safe the roads continually gets raised. We will continue to work with our mainland roads, roads policing colleagues who support Isle of Wight officers through effective operations, catching dangerous drivers, including those under the influence of drink and drugs. Whilst the island remains a safe place to live and work, we're not immune to those that peddle misery through illegal drug dealing and the serious violence they inflict at times. We have an effective area crime team who have had notable successes this year with arrests, drug seizures and convictions. Finally, domestic abuse will remain, will remain a priority. It's a crime that can hurt anyone regardless of age, class or standing in society. It damages victims physically and mentally and can damage the health and well-being of children who grow up experiencing it. We will continue to work with our community safety partners to protect victims and pursue perpetrators. It's going to be a busy summer again, but I'm confident our teams will deliver an effective policing service with the, with the same commitment I see daily. Now we move to what's on. The Isle of Wight Festival marks a milestone with a free exhibition. The Isle of Wight Festival celebrates its 25th outing this year with a special free Experience 25 exhibition. Recognising its all iterations of the festival since 1968, the Experience 25 collection highlights both the original events and those since 2002 when the festival was revived by John Giddings. Hosted by the Newport and Carisbrook Community Council at 64 High Street, Newport, the exhibition will be on from June the 3rd to July the 29th. Archives from the festival's initial run of 1968, 1969 and 1970 are being provided by Ray Falk, who organised those editions alongside his brothers. Ray said, My family is delighted to contribute to this commemorative show with historic items and archives. It is with great pride that our embryonic rock festivals of more than half a century ago have been so successfully and splendidly revived. 22 years of visionary enterprise has guaranteed the island's formidable prowess in the wider world of contemporary music. The collection includes memorabilia from performances by Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, The Doors and Jimi Hendrix. Additionally, Experience 25 will present materials from the recently concluded Dumbola exhibition Freshwater and will highlight performances from artists of the past 22 years, including Amy Winehouse, The Rolling Stones and David Bowie. The exhibition also features previously unreleased artwork. For the first time, all the festivals are being celebrated together in one for exhibition. And to support the exhibition, a shop will be opened, selling festival t-shirts and posters, including a new vintage line. Books narrating the 1969 and 1970 festivals, written by Ray Falk, will also be on sale, with proceeds supporting Dimbola. The exhibition will be open 9am to 5pm from Monday to Friday. That includes the festival weekend of June the 22nd and 23rd, along with selected Saturdays. The team is run by volunteers and is inviting additional help during the exhibition and they quote either an email address or a phone number you can call if you're interested in helping. Performing at Strings Bar and Venue on Friday the 31st of May are China Crisis. 
Advance tickets are £27.50 from stringsbaranvenue.com. Elsewhere, the rescheduled Isle of Wight Spring Art and Garden Fair takes place on the 18th and 19th of May from 10am to 5pm each day at Northwood House and Park Ward Avenue, Cowes. Tickets, adults only, £5 each or two for £9, under 16s of three. Info at northwoodhouse.org forward slash events and blank expression live music at the Wellington Hotel, Belgrave Road, Ventnor, PO38 1JH on Saturday the 18th of May at 8pm is free entry an electrifying night of post-punk and new wave rock. On Tuesday the 14th of May, the West White Heritage Centre in Freshwater is holding an open day from 10am to 4pm. This is a chance to look around, find out what we do and how we do it, browse through the many photograph albums and chat to members of the archive group over coffee. Island Movie Free on Streaming App the Beast Must Die, which was filmed on the Isle of Wight in 2020, is now available to watch for free on ITVX. The TV show stars Jared Harris, Kush Jumbo, Billy Howell and Geraldine James, along with hundreds of island residents as supporting actors. It was Britbox streaming service's first original drama when it was first released. Set on the Isle of Wight, the series featured a wide range of familiar locations and properties. Eleven local actors were lucky enough to be given con contract roles and had their names on the credits. They were George East, Sergeant, Ian Mouth, Sergeant, Jamal Watt, Kaiden, Talula Smith, Gabrielle the Bank Clerk, Sam Patey, Doorman, John Byrne, Harbour Master, Judy Huddleston, Roll, Roll, Rollo Little, Reza Javid, Arthur Attrell, Tennis Player Double for Rollo, Arthur Bicknell, Young George, and Lalani Taylor Rice, Salma. The show is a revenge thriller starring Kush Jumbo as a woman left bereft by the death of her six year old son in a hit and run incident. The only thing keeping her going is the idea of hunting down the man responsible. A creative hub is to make a unique big top tent, which is expected to serve as a flexible mid-scale venue for island-wide events. Ventnor Exchange is set to embark on the ambitious project after securing a £225,000 grant from the Arts Council England's Capital Investment Programme. With this financial support, Ventnor Exchange aims to realise its much dreamt about ambition to commission a versatile mid-scale venue that can travel between different towns and villages and hosting a range of performances and events. Jack Whitewood, who is the Creative and Development Director at Ventnor Exchange, explained, We want to reimagine what a theatre or arts centre can be. This will be a new town hall for the whole of the Isle of Wight, ensuring every community can have access to an amazing facility. Working with local residents, together we will decide what this new venue is called, how it's used and where it visits. Local ownership of this key piece of infrastructure was also helped secure the long-term future of Ventnor Fringe. Megan Stisted, the Creative Projects Manager at Ventnor Exchange said it would offer opportunities for the Brave Island programme, which supports young people with training, placements and work opportunities. From circus skills to gig nights, new on-stage and backstage roles will be created. We will have a phenomenal new space based right here to train young people with. And now on to Reader's Letters. Starting the letter from Ken Beckon from Cowles, titled Would a Bridge Bring Grey Squirrels? It appears the island of Anglesey is concerned for their red squirrel population as grey squirrels are crossing the two bridges linked to the mainland. May I be assured that Red Funnel and White Link staff will be issued with 
crawl nets and detailed to, patro to patrol the decks in case the crafty Welsh greys think we are in easy touch. Will this also halt talk about our proposed tunnel stroke bridge? We should be told. Peter Shreve, the Isle of Wight National Education Union, says hungry pupils struggle to learn. Last year, the local NEU petition, No Island Child Left Behind, had 573 signatures. This term, the NEU is renewing its call for a free hot school lunch for every child in every primary school. The national emphasis will be a free school meals for all national tour, travelling to as many schools as possible, possibly to the Isle of Wight too. The bus was first seen at this Easter's National NEU Conference in Bournemouth. The evidence is clear, hungry pupils struggle to learn. This is why, when Sadiq Khan became the first person ever to win a third term as Mayor of London, he stood by his pre-election promise to make free school meals permanent for all primary school children in London. This can and should be the future for all primary school children on the Isle of Wight too. London has shown what's possible. Schools are increasingly under pressure to support families. Schools are now expected to be more than just education. Schools are superb at filling the gaps, but there is still a shortage of services. If we can entice the bus to the island and encourage pupils to participate in some way, we can make a difference to the lives and education of young pupils. Let's help children thrive. Free school meals for all primary pupils will certainly help. The Star Letter says, thank you, Tim. Dear Editor, I am an appreciative customer of the pharmacist in Key Street, Yarmouth, Tim Gibbs. He works up to around 100 hours a week in some cases, even including Christmas Day and all the bank holidays. And time and time again, pharmacists get more and more extras put upon them, like vaccinations and prescribing drugs in emergency cases. But linking up with Brookside Medical Centre, where my husband and I are patients, the service has been tremendous. We both have had emergencies from time to time, three for my husband. During this time, our phone service was cut off. Age concern came to our help, and Tim has been out to us, even at half past nine on dark, wet, horrible nights, to deliver us a package of medicines. Nowadays, if I don't have one of my medicines, I don't panic, as I know it will arrive. We don't have any transport, as neither of us drive, so knowing that he will deliver what we need, when he can really, when he can, really helps put my mind at rest. That dear, poor, generous-hearted man will go crack if he doesn't get some relief. How he's doing it is beyond me, as I know the kind of pressure he must be under. He really is a lovely man who deserves recognition. He puts his patients first. It's a part of the good old days. There aren't seen as much now. Everyone does their own thing now. This is signed by an appreciative customer at Ningwood. Name provided, but not printed by request. Think about it, says Dr Ian Saxon of Braiding. In Victorian England, it was illegal to be homeless. Are we to go down the same road again under current government legislation? Recently, I was reminded of the words, the poor will always be with you. They come from the Bible. Other holy texts are, of course, available. The Bible is used for the oath in our courts and in our Parliament. Yet this very Parliament seeks to fine a person who has nothing. You may have bought this newspaper, but it will also be someone's bed tonight. Think on these things. Hacked Off by I. Winfield Freshwater Dear Editor, our attention-seeking MP outed himself in the comments on Tuesday, claiming he was the most hacked MP in Parliament. Why on earth would anyone want to hack our Bob? Were they trying to discover what brand of barbecue sauce he dips his half a sausage in? Perhaps he is trying to garner the sympathy votes from his waning supporters. The good news is that Bob Seeley won't need to worry about being hacked for much longer, 
because one thing is for sure, he probably has the most hacked off constituents of any MP, having spectacularly failed to deliver the island deal he so enthusiastically promoted during the last general election. Down with the internet being down, say three young people, Matthew Artris Brown, aged 17, Ella Crowther, aged 18, and Amber Hunt, aged 18, all of Ride. Dear Editor, we believe there is over-reliance on the internet in academic environments. We attended a sixth form where the internet went down, demonstrating the importance of investment in local client and server infrastructure. Because of this, we were unable to utilise any of the services needed to revise. For example, we use Google Classroom for communication between teachers and students and for storing and setting work. With no internet, we were unable to access those resources, greatly impacting our revision. We have three weeks, give or take, until A-level exams. If we don't make the most of this time, we will fall behind. We were also unable to complete work, sign into the computer, or even photocopy or print with the school computer provided. If we could use local software, such as Microsoft Word, we could edit documents regardless of the availability of the internet, preventing the major setbacks we are experiencing. We have school-issued Chromebooks, very much a downgrade for the computer we previously used, which ran Windows, enabling us to access documents offline. With the local storage server, you could store and edit data on a server within the school without needing the internet, providing a fail-safe when the internet does fail. Moreover, teachers are pushed towards using Chromebooks for teaching. We assume this is the same with all AET academies, stopping them from using PowerPoint, important for accessing slideshows offline. Instead, they are encouraged to use Google Slides, which is completely online, and without any internet connection, completely useless. In conclusion, to move forward, we should take a step back re-evaluate our position on reliance of the internet in the academic environment and move towards a more reliable, stable and long-term future. How Not to Manage the NHS by Tom Warner Brading Dear Editor, The statement that our NHS is free at the point of delivery is often confused with the idea that it's free. It is not. We all pay for our NHS through our taxes. I am sure Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board do not see themselves as a cancer purposely installed to drag our NHS down, Island Soapbox, May the 3rd. They probably believe they do a splendid job producing costs and saving taxpayers money by cutting back on whatever they can, along with shifting the burden of delivery onto other agencies, for example, charities like Mountbatten. It's the inevitable consequences when you employ accountants rather than healthcare professionals to lead organisations tasked with delivering medical services with insufficient funds. What happens when demand outstrips supply in an overstretched health sector? Several things. You can offer a fast track two tier service for those who can afford to pay. You can also redefine how waiting lists are calculated in a bid to manipulate downwards the huge number of patients waiting for treatment. For example, once you have seen a consultant and are possibly waiting for follow-up surgery, you are automatically removed from waiting lists, even though you are still waiting for that treatment. You can reduce demand on services by offering those in chronic pain, with conditions that are only going to get progressively worse, a way of shuttling off and ending suffering. It was Boris Johnson who reportedly said, let's the bodies pile high. That seems to be the answer from a government that spent the last 14 years asleep at the wheel whilst demands on our National Health Service were changing. And it's goodbye from me, Sam. And goodbye from Kate. Goodbye. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.
Hello. A great deal of attention is paid these days to the nation's sleep problems and surveys suggest that for a whole host of reasons, stress, bad diet, too much heat, too little heat, alcohol, many of us aren't getting the quality or quantity of sleep that we need. All of those are as likely to apply to visually impaired people, of course, but What is also well established is that there are factors that particularly interfere with visually impaired people's sleep patterns, especially those with little or no light perception. Well, in this programme, we'll be trying to disentangle some of these factors, what treatments are available, who they'll work for, and indeed why people are still getting very conflicting advice and sometimes no advice at all. Our first guest, whose email prompted us to return to this subject, has no light perception and has had severe sleep problems throughout her life. She's also had difficulties in getting the treatment she thought she needed. Tina Snow, explain what your sleep problems have been in a bit more detail. It's a very historic problem. Um, I've got retinopathy of prematurity. When I was a child, I would be asleep all day and awake all night. Must yeah. have been hell for you, but hell for your parents, <laughs> I would have thought. <laughs> yeah, nothing was known about non-sleep, like 24-hour disorder, not in 1968. It wasn't until very much later in my life that I thought, well, this just can't be normal because I'm constantly battling with, like, having the desire to sleep at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. My sleep pattern roughly runs two weeks on average of about three to four hours sleep. The actual sleep deprivation is actually worse than sight loss because it does wear you down. You've got to go to work. You've got to hold down the job. You can't stay in bed all day and say to people, well, I can't come to work or I can't minute that meeting for you because I'm a, an admin assistant for the local authority and <laughs> you just want to stay in bed. But life isn't like that. You've just got to get on with it. But it's impacted on my physical and mental health over the years. I've had periods of depression sometimes. A small problem can seem to be a big problem because you've had lack of sleep. There's been a lack of understanding of what non-24 sleep weight disorder is. I was driven to do my own research and I thought, I recognise this condition. I think this is me I'm looking at. And this tends to always come back to this issue of melatonin, doesn't it? Which is a natural hormone and the idea is that this treats the problem that you've got because you haven't got light perception you don't regulate your body clock as the 24-hour cycle gradually gets a bit out of whack but why has it been so hard for you to get the treatment you needed well melatonin is a prescription only drug well i contacted my gp who referred me to the oxford sleep clinic in 2020 it it was during lockdown so i had a telephone consultation and they recommended um, I be prescribed 10 milligrams of um, melatonin, which does seem quite high. And there are other concerns about it, which we may talk to with one of our other guests. There is the problem of the quality of it. There's the issue of cost. There are all sorts of things. We're also joined by your current GP, Dr Tim Whelan, from Newport Health Centre on the Isle of Wight, where you live. Dr Whelan, just explain what you've been able to do for Tina and what you haven't been able to do I suppose. Thank you Peter. Well Tina recounted this uh, story to me and um, I have to say it's uh, new territory for me too but I did have the benefit of reading the letter from the consultant neurologist in the Oxford Sleep Centre and he had recommended melatonin but admitted that it was not available on licence. It was not licensed for this particular condition and that many GPs around the country might have difficulty in prescribing it. But melatonin is licensed for the treatment of insomnia in the short term in older adults. And it's also licensed for longer term treatment of children and younger adults for other conditions such as learning disabilities and um, challenging behaviour. So I did a bit of research around the subject and frankly there's not much evidence about the treatment of this specific condition but there is anecdotal evidence that melatonin can improve the onset of sleep and reduce the amount of 
time spent awake subsequently during the night. So I checked that we had covered all the other possible reasons for Tina's sleeping difficulties. And there are also a few little basic background checks to ensure that kidney function and liver function are all right. As I say, I had the um, recommendation from this consultant neurologist. I also decided to check with the chief pharmacist of my integrated care board, which covers the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And he thought it sounded a, a sensible proposition. So I decided it was fair to prescribe. Now, I have to say that prescriptions are very much a matter of individual responsibility for GPs. Some GPs might not be comfortable, but um, just because the drug is not licensed for a particular condition, it doesn't mean to say it's unsafe. It just means that the, the company, when they submitted their original request for a license for this medication, didn't mention that condition. So we started at the, the very lowest dose because I'm always, um, I'm a sort of GP who tries not to put patients on unnecessary medication and always use the lowest dose, which might produce the required benefit. And all I can say is that so far, so good. This is very early days. I have to add that little caveat and we have to see how things go. But uh, I'll be reviewing Tina's progress over the next few weeks to see how we get along. It'll be very interesting for me as well to um, inform future possibilities. And just so we've understood this properly, you've done this basically on your discretion. It's not licensed. So who's paying? (laughs) GPs and hospital doctors are allowed to prescribe medications, even if they're not strictly licensed for that condition. So long as we adhere to the the guidelines of the General Medical Council, which does say we should put the welfare of our patients first, of course. And one could argue that by denying Tina this medication, I could be leaving her exposed to potentially avoidable misery. But you're right, it, it is a personal decision by each doctor, because we are all individually responsible for the prescriptions we issue. To go back to Tina, just briefly, your GP there said so far so good. What's been the effect for you? It's been a miracle and I really can't thank Dr Whelan enough. I'm waking up feeling quite bright, quite focused, no napping at daytime or drowsiness. And I'm just feeling mentally and physically feeling really happy and really well in myself. OK, well, in a moment, we will hear from someone whose situation is rather different. But it'll be clearer, I think, if we stay with Tina's situation for a moment and bring in our expert, Professor Stephen Lockley, Vice-Chancellor's Fellow at Surrey Sleep Research Centre and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard University. And Stephen's been studying non 24 hour sleep wake disorder which is what tina has for the past 30 odd years professor lockley we're not expecting you to provide an instant diagnosis and a treatment plan for an individual without a lot more information but generally what do you take from tina's experience so tina's description of non 24 hour disorder is is very accurate it's really not a sleep disorder per se, it's really a circadian clock disorder. Normally, our 24-hour clocks in the brain would be synchronized by the daily light-dark cycle. But if your eyes are not functional to detect the light, to send that signal to the brain, so someone with no light perception or, or no eyes, then the clock runs on its own internal time. On average, in blind people, that's around 24 and a half hours a day. So what the biological clock does is try to make Tina go to sleep half an hour later every day. Now, for a few days, that's fine. But of course, after 24 days, the biological clock is telling Tina to go to sleep in the middle of the day and then stay awake all night. And then she goes round and round in this cyclic disruption. And so sometimes it's hard to understand that there's a cycle because you need to really look at the sleep pattern over some weeks or months But what you end up observing in patients is good sleep, then bad sleep, then good sleep, then bad sleep in this never-ending cycle. And that's why it's called non-24-hour sleep weight disorder. Now, there are only two treatments for this. Uh, Melatonin is one, and, and we reported that for the first time really over 20 years ago at Surrey. And then there's a melatonin like drug, a melatonin agonist, which has been approved by the European Medicines Agency, uh, but I don't think it's available yet in the UK. 
But both of these drugs act in the same way. They provide a replacement time cue for the light signal that is missing. There are actually melatonin receptors on the clock in the brain. And then if you take melatonin or tazimeltion, which is the other compound, every 24 hours, it provides a time cue for the body clock to lock onto. So it's quite different to how you would take a sleeping pill. You know, you may take it relative to bedtime. What's very important for entraining or resetting the biological clock, which is what we're trying to do here, is to take it at the same clock time every day so that the the 24-hour clock has got a time cue to latch onto. The question I must ask you is, you know, you said that this has been known for 20 years or more. Why would it take so long to have a a solution to Tina's problem? Well, there is a solution in that you can obtain melatonin. And as Dr. Whelan has done, and and I've worked with other physicians in the past, you can get a melatonin prescription on on a named patient basis. So access isn't really an issue. It's just a, a step more you have to go through to obtain it, and, and it's quite an inexpensive drug, I understand, so cost isn't really a, a problem. It is just about having the, the GPs or the sleep physicians or neurologists understand the real cause of the disorder, because this isn't a sleeping disorder uh, in itself, it's a clock disorder, and so melatonin is working through resetting the clock, which then resets sleep, but also resets mood, metabolism, immune function all the rhythms the clock controls. So it's absolutely the right treatment. And yes, we probably do need an easy way for people to access it. Oh, well, that's the Um, problem, isn't it? And that's what blind people have been complaining about, you know. And I suppose what I want to ask you is, is there a simple answer to the question, when is it appropriate to prescribe melatonin for someone? So if a totally blind person, meaning someone with no light perception, who reports cyclic sleep disturbances, they very, very likely have this disorder. We, we think anywhere from 55 to 70% of totally blind people have this disorder. Then melatonin would really be the first choice treatment or tazimeltion if that's available in the UK. And the lower doses, as, as Dr. Whelan mentioned, a lower dose is actually a little better than a higher dose. And so even something as low as a 0.5 milligram dose is shown to be very effective to treat this disorder. But it's important to be taken at the same clock time every day to give that time cue to the brain. Let me therefore introduce Corcabatia. You also have a considerable sleep problem, but you do have some light perception. Just explain a bit more about your situation and why you think melatonin is the right thing for you. Absolutely. So again, I was born with retinopathy of prematurity. I have no functioning vision in my right eye, but I have what the ophthalmologists state as light perception in my left eye. My sleep pattern has been disturbed for many a year and I've looked at alternative remedies. But again, sadly, I was told I couldn't access any melatonin. I couldn't access anything in relation to support until now and it was a GP that prescribed me melatonin. So you've been prescribed melatonin but you were complaining I think about the extent to which you'd had conflicting information and you'd also been told pretty definitely if you've got any light perception it won't be any use to you. I think you have been told Yes, that. So, yeah. so I was told that if an individual if they can see any differentiation between daylight and night, then Mm. it wouldn't work for them, that it's not of any benefit. You have to be a totally blind person with no functioning vision. So there seems to be a lot of contradiction. Well, it does. Just while you're on, let me come back to Professor Lockley and say, I mean, is that right? Would you say to someone, this won't be any good for you at all, even though she's obviously taken it at different times? No, not necessarily. So there are a small number of cases of people with light perception and even with false sight that can develop non-24-hour sleep-wake disorder. It's much rarer in those individuals and someone who is totally blind, but more workup is needed. And so what we usually do in our research studies, but can also be done clinically, is we measure a marker of the biological clock. We measure sometimes your natural melatonin rhythm or your natural cortisol rhythm, usually in urine samples. It's very straightforward to do. We've done it in hundreds of people. And then we measure your internal clock time to see if it's synchronized to 24 hours or to see if it shows a non-24 hour rhythm. 
if we can confirm uh, that there is a non 24 hour rhythm in these hormonal markers, then Kalku would have non 24 hour sleep wake disorder and then would be eligible for melatonin treatment. Mm. But we, we need to make sure that people don't think that melatonin is useful for non circadian sleep disorders. It really isn't. It's not a very good sleeping pill. It's not very good at tackling insomnia, for example. It really only is very useful at resetting the clock for someone who has this non-24 hour sleep weight disorder through visual mm. impairment. But I, I suppose, therefore, the thing I want to kind of press with you is I'm just wondering why people are getting such conflicting information and why Tina and Corcab have, you know, lived much of their lives without apparently getting the answers to the questions that you're actually giving us now and which Tim Whelan has attempted to do for Tina. Well, you heard it from Dr. Whelan. This this is new to him. There is not very much education around sleep disorders in general. Uh, In medical training, there's even less known or taught about circadian rhythm sleep disorders, which is what this is. And non-24 hours is, is quite a rare disorder. But, of course, there are centres to contact. We've been studying this at Surrey, in fact, since the 1980s. In fact, uh, Professor Josephine Arendt, who sadly passed away recently, was the first person to give melatonin to a blind man to treat this disorder. And so there is the information out there. There's, there's a lot of research out there, but you know, doctors need to do a little bit of digging to reach us. And we're happy to help if patients want to get in touch with us at the University of Surrey. We're happy to provide the information to GPs with, with the reasons why this is important for this a group of patients. Okay, that's really helpful. Just finally, because we're now short of time, but Tina, you have a world expert at your disposal. I do think you had certainly something you wanted to ask. Um, I, actually, he has answered my <laughs> questions during his comprehensive discussion. But I was just going to say, is it one of those treatments which you stay on for life now we've discovered it? Professor Lockley? <laughs> yeah, so it is a lifetime treatment, yes, because it's providing that replacement for the loss of light information each and every day. So if you stop taking the melatonin, you will revert back to that non-24 hour day, uh, which is unfortunate, but at least the treatment on a daily basis works. In terms of the the optimal treatment, we should be looking for a fast release preparation, not a sustained release and a low dose, something around 0.5 milligrams would, would be ample. So an hour or two before you maybe want to go to sleep, that's fine. So do I need to change that to a short release 0.5? Uh, well, uh, Dr. Will and I can get in touch about dose and the preparation just to make sure you get in the, oh. the optimal one. But taking the, whatever dose of melatonin at the same time every day is what's key for this disorder. Well, that's great. We've brought you and Dr. Whelan together, so hopefully we've got a whole team on your case now, Tina. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Whelan (laughs) and also Mm. Professor Lockley. It's like a miracle has occurred in my life after 56 years. Well, it's life-changing. Thank you very much. Well, to Professor Stephen Lockley, to Dr. Timothy Whelan, to uh, Corcab Asia, and to Tina Snow, who raised this, thank you very much indeed. And that's it for today, but whenever we've raised this issue in the past, there's always been a host of comments and questions from you. So if you'd like to add to it, you can email in touch at bbc.co.uk, leave a voice message on 0161 836 1338, or go to our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch. From me, Peter White, producer Beth Hemmings, and studio managers, Mitchell Goodall and uh, Jack Morris. Goodbye. Freshwater area, 1 School Green Road. Sandown area, the old comical St John's Road. 9 Station Avenue, 10 St John's Road. Shanklin area, the Crab Inn, 94 High Street and British Heart Foundation in Regent Street.